Hey, this is Brooke Hensley. I'm the ultrasound fellow at Massachusetts General Hospital, and today I have Andrew Leteplo, our emergency ultrasound fellowship director, who has a cool case to share with us today. Hello, Brooke. Hello, everybody. Uh, so this is an awesome case we had uh, last week. Um, it's a 20-year-old male, no medical problems, a sore throat for the past week or so. He had seen his doctor diagnose him with strep and started him on antibiotics. Didn't get better, so a few days later he went to another hospital and they diagnosed him with, they said, you have a peritonsillar abscess. And he said, they stuck a needle in my mouth three times. They called the ENT doctor. Nobody could get fluid out. So they sent me home. So now he presents and his swelling's getting worse. He's having difficulty speaking. And this is what it looks like. So what do you think? Mm. Well, definitely uh, based on this patient's exam, my top differentials would include a peritonsillar abscess or a peritonsillar cellulitis. Good. Um, He's clearly got this unilateral uh, swelling with some uvular deviation, and it's, it's very prominent there, right? So what would you do? So, you know, you would think that by your exam, you'd be able to differentiate between peritonsillar cellulitis and an abscess, but I've definitely been surprised in the past. So what I normally would do is use an ultrasound to see if there's a fluid collection there or... Good. That's a perfect answer as an ultrasound fellow. But I will tell you that my resident had already ordered a CAT scan for this patient. Um, until I saw him, thankfully, before the CAT scan had happened. And so we went uh, to do an ultrasound. So how do you do an ultrasound for peritonsillar abscess? So normally what I do in the past is I grab an endocavitary probe, not a transvaginal probe. You never want to say that never, around a person. Right, never, never say I'm about to stick the transvaginal probe in your mouth. Yeah, make sure you cover up the probe appropriately, and then you place the probe inside the patient's mouth, or actually sometimes I've had them place it in their own mouth, and... Uh, place the, the end of the probe right up against where the swelling is. Good. And what you can sometimes see is something like this. So this is a nice round area here. It's quite anechoic or very hypoechoic in the middle. And you can see that the footprint of the probe is actually touching that area. So you can see comfortably um, that this is an abscess. You can also see the carotid and it's quite deep to the abscess. But that helps visualize that. Good. So... Um, that is, a, that is a technique that is commonly used. Um, I personally have had some problems with that. Um, yeah. One of them, what do you think? So the thing that's nice about the endocavitary probe is that it, you know, it can fit inside the patient's mouth. It's the only probe that fits inside the patient's mouth in order to see the, the abscess or right. swelling and see what it is. However, once you uh, identify it using the endocavitary probe, you have to remove it and then follow it up with a blind poke. Right, and so the two big challenges are mostly that you see these patients with trismus that can barely open their mouths, you're putting this gigantic probe in the mouth and you're using up most of that real estate of the mouth. So to get a light in there and to stick a needle in there makes it very challenging. The other aspect is that with when this is done correctly, you've got the probe touching the exact spot where you want the needle to go. And so actually seeing your needle fall in real time becomes a little bit of a challenge. Yeah. So even when I've seen a very clear fluid collection, sometimes I still end up poking the patient three or four times trying to find the exact spot where I had my probe before. Right. And the other problem is we didn't have this endocavitary probe. So um, what we did is we actually used a curvilinear probe. And I've done this before also with a linear probe. Here we see a very gray-haired gentleman um, with... When you see the probe, this is the location. So we've got the probe marker right here pointing posteriorly, and the front's kind of toward the front of the mouth. So if you think about what this looks like on your screen, you see this image right here. Okay, so just some anatomy here. Here's the tonsillar area. The carotid is right here. And here is air and tongue with inside of the mouth. What do you think of this image? Well, it definitely looks like there's a, an area of... Uh, hypoechoic and heterogeneous debris in here that would make me concerned for a peritonsillar abscess. Absolutely. Now, it's not always this clear. Sometimes you don't get, it doesn't look as anechoic and you have to kind of squish it or compress it a little bit or have a very high suspicion. But in this case, we saw a very nice round um, abscess that we knew definitively right there he did have a peritonsillar abscess. Uh, we canceled the CAT scan right away, saved some radiation, able to measure it and so you can see the measurements about three by three and a half by three centimeters. Um, and 
we knew right there what the size is and that he definitely had a paratonsillar abscess. So this is the submandibular approach. Great, so once you make the diagnosis, so you would still have to do a blind stick, right? Well, you would think, um, but actually no. We have ultrasound and why not use it for guidance? Well, normally when I do an ultrasound guided procedure, I always put my needle where the probe is, but clearly you're not going to be sticking the needle externally and draining it externally, so how are you right. going to do this? Right, good point. Okay, so, right, we're not going to stick the needle through the skin to reach it because your carotid is, is right around here and that would be too risky. So, we're going to do what, what I call a telescopic submandibular approach, right? It's telescopic because from the Greek that means tele at a distance, scopes to see. So we're seeing and we're guiding from a distance. So the probe, and this is the only procedure I can think of where the probe and needle are not in the exact same place. The probe is still on the outside underneath the chin and the needle is going to go in the mouth. So what I had the resident do, and he had never drained one of these before, I first had him take this needle and you can see right here a needle with the cap on it. And I said, poke around in the mouth, and I'll keep looking. Look where you think that fluid might be. And when he got to this point right here, I said, that's it. And I can see he was only about one centimeter or less away from that fluid with no concerning structures in the middle. So we knew that that was the location. He pushed kind of hard, made a little indentation of the needle cap there. Um, and then we prepped his needle. So... What are the advantages of doing this? Why don't you so, describe this? No matter what approach you choose to use, it's always great to think about your safeguard preps. And here you can see how close the carotid can be to the area where you want to poke. So here we're doing a needle aspiration, and we measured that the peritonsillar abscess uh, fluid is about one to two centimeters from the surface of the abscess. So we cut the cap and put it back on the needle so that if the patient seizes or syncopizes, which has happened to me when draining an abscess, and I was thankful that I had this cap on, that it's a, actually a safeguard for yeah, you. Yeah, perfect, good. So we did exactly that. We put a cap on for about two centimeters. And then I had him anesthetize, right? So here, I put the needle in, and he went a little deeper than I thought. I was hoping he would just get the uh, anesthetic right in the actual tissue. But he went a little deeper, and, and watch it again. You can see as he's injecting the lidocaine, the fluid cavity is filling up with that lidocaine. So we knew he's in the right spot. He then withdrew the needle, and I said, put the big needle exactly where you anesthetize it, where the patient has that little drop of blood. And you can see, here's the needle, and he's entering the cavity. You can see the needle tip right here, enters the peritonsillar abscess cavity. I can see it the whole time. The patient's comfortable. He's got a fully open mouth with which he can shine a light in and see exactly where he's going. And once he's in there, then we just had him aspirate. And you can see that he aspirated the fluid and that, that black area inside the cavity is shrinking to the point where there's nothing left and the cavity is completely obliterated. This is great because you can actually see the needle in real time like you would normally do with any kind of ultrasound guided procedure involving a needle or right. any other sharp objects and you can also keep your carotid artery in sight and know exactly where you are at all times. Right, exactly. And it requires a little bit of rotating your probe so that you see the needle in plane um, in the long axis, but it's very easy to do from a superficial point of view. The patient is, was quite comfortable um, and we were all able to watch the needle the whole time. And so once he, once he aspirated and removed the needle, we actually got about well, that was exactly it. It was about 10 cc's of this purulent material. Uh, got a little blood at the end. It kept squirting out of the mouth, <laughs> hitting us in the face. It was very pulsatile. And but the patient syncopized. The patient syncopized. We couldn't figure it out <laughs> what happened, but we just assumed that he did fine. No, I'm kidding. The patient, uh, we, had, we didn't even come near the carotid because you can see we capped the needle safely. Uh, the patient was amazed at how, uh, how great he felt and how quick it was. He said something like, that's it. And um, indeed, that was, that was it. All right, so some take-home points. Number one, don't ever say transvaginal uh, ultrasound probe, but you don't even have to say it if you're going to use the telescopic submandibular approach. And when you're using this approach, you can use the linear or the curvilinear probe. It's also re -import really important to cap your needle when you're doing this procedure. Right, and the patient did well. We saved the CT. You couldn't imagine how excited the resident was. He had stayed two hours after his shift just to do this procedure because he was so busy. 
And he said, wow, that was worth every second. He left with this giant grin on his face, as did the patient. So um, great. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks, everybody, for, uh, for listening. And um, visit look, our website. Visit our website. Thanks.